1960s. Record wheat crops. Canada, the 1930s. On the western plains, men are destitute. These are two faces of the prairies. On the prairies, the growing season is short, only five months in twelve. But in just a few years, men, women and children from many nations turned this land into one of the Earth's great granaries. Part of the North American wheatlands, the original Canadian prairies stretch 300 miles north to south and 800 miles east to west. In the north is a wooded region, the parklands. The Rockies and the Canadian Shield are natural boundaries to the north west and east. To the south, the 49th parallel forms a political border. By the mid-19th century, all this land, part of a great fur empire, had been acquired by the Hudson's Bay Company. Between two small settlements in the far west and one on the Red River, the only men were hunters, traders, missionaries, and the original inhabitants. In eastern Canada, a shortage of agricultural land drove men westwards. Below the border, men had reached the edge of the plains. North of the line, they lay empty, open, and inviting. 1867, Confederation. The new federal government buys much of the western territories from the Hudson's Bay Company. The Red River settlement becomes the province of Manitoba. Law is established. Red Fife wheat is introduced and withstands late spring and early autumn. In 1900, the century that was said to belong to Canada began well for the West. Encouraged by the railways who part owned the land, and badly needed the revenue its sale would bring, encouraged by the government, which was fearful of losing the open spaces by default, encouraged by the East, which required a market for its manufacturers, they came from all Europe, from the United States, from Eastern Canada. In 13 years, almost three million. Newcomers could obtain title to their land by working it for three years. 160 acres of virgin soil, a quarter section, cost just $10. Parts of the plains of Manitoba and the new provinces of Saskatchewan and Alberta became the estate of the drylanders, the short grass farmers. values had to be learned, and learned quickly. The children. Wheat raised, destroyed, by hail, by rust, by us, and small failures. But one year, 14,000 Maritimers came west. Road, rail, 
telephone linked the prairie communities with the rest of the country and drew neighbors closer together. The telephone was usually a party line. How many guarded conversations, heavy with innuendo? How many homes had these three books in common? How many mail order parcels bringing Montreal, Toronto, Winnipeg to the isolated farm? as enjoyable as anywhere else. Comfortable, warm, slower than today. How many schoolhouses were refuges during the unexpected blizzard, the storm of rain or dust? Markets, prices, climate, all were variable from year to year. The men, ever individuals, organized themselves. Cooperation was essential. Interdependence took root. The Western peoples, despite their ethnic differences, grew together in the growing villages, towns, and cities strung along the track. Be it understood, said the Calgary eye-opener, that ranking in importance in the order named the CPR, Clifford Sifton, and the Almighty composed the Trinity of Canada. During the day, the farmers complained about the freight rates. But in the long evenings, they and their families welcomed the mournful sound of the locomotive whistle. In the time of depression, trains still ran, but with different freight. A world farms dwindled. The unemployed made cities grow. Possessions, hope, dignity disappeared. Causes, reasons, whys and wherefores didn't help men then, but they did result in plans for the future. World conditions and new technologies encourage greater variety in farming, new industries. The pioneer era was ended by war. Ahead lay the responsibilities of a nation. 